Hi, this is Ed Kohler with Extreme Networks, and we're back with you for the third in our video series on setting up and enabling a Fabric Connect node and its associated services. This video is going to focus on taking a detailed tour of the link state database that's generated by the ISIS protocol, which serves the control plane for Fabric Connect. In order to really understand the details of that, it's important that we kind of review what Fabric Connect is about from a protocol architecture, because it is vastly different from the normal IP routing protocol stacks that we're used to dealing with from a historical perspective. So before we go into detail on the link state database, I kind of want to go over the protocol architecture differences and what Fabric is about and, and how the link state database plays in the environment. So with that, let's move forward and we'll take a look at the traditional architectures of Fabric Connect versus traditional MPLS. Now, in the past, uh, we've always dealt with this stack, um, the stack of four, as it were. Uh, and we have the Ethernet base itself, which is uh, the forwarding substrate that's provided by Ethernet, the physical infrastructure, as it were. And then we have two protocols that kind of run over the Ethernet infrastructure called 802.1D and 802.1Q. Those really provide two things. They provide a loop-free environment for a series of scoped flooding domains. That's it. There is no sense of a path at this level. We don't really get to the sense of a path until we have a layer three unicast service protocol such as RIP, OSPF, BGP, and note that they're all based on IP. So we really don't have a sense of a service path in the traditional model until we talk about the IP protocol. And then if we're going to do multicast, we typically overlay PIM nowadays. Uh, DVMRP is more or less deprecated, but PIM is usually typically run over and dependent on the unicast routing service. And then if we want to virtualize this, we have to kind of contain it all in a VRF and peer our VRFs using either uh, daisy chained OSPF or BGP, IP, VPN, light type instances, things of that nature. Or we could invoke a full stack virtualization model such as that provided by MPLS. And as we can see, we have layer two virtualized unicast services through VPLS, ELAN, ELINE. We also have RFC 4364 for layer three virtualized unicast services, BGP MPLS, IP VPN infrastructure. And then if we're going to run multicast within these services, we typically overlay draft Rosen in the whole stack kind of works but no one's gonna argue that it is not complex. It is very complex. It is difficult to provision, and more importantly, it's difficult to troubleshoot, and it's difficult to administrate. There's also the aspect of top-down vertical dependencies that uh, this creates, in some instances, a house of cards scenario in the fact that lower-level protocol failures can cause really the whole service architecture to fail and need to reconverge. And again, largely, this is because of the fact that Ethernet has no sense of a path. Really, everything is built on IP and kind of moves from the IP level up from a service path perspective. Now, the difference with Fabric Connect is SPB takes the notion of a service path at its foundational ground level. So the physical infrastructure itself with 802.1AH, MAC and MAC encapsulation, provides this sense of a path. And that, that is we we've seen in some of the earlier videos with the show commands and things of that nature, there's quite a bit of forwarding information that we have at this level. But we have to automate it. We have to program it. And that's really what ISIS does. It provides the SPBM control plane protocol for the fabric and its associated services. This is an important delta to understand architecturally. Many people, when we mention ISIS, typically invoke the notion of ISIS used in a layer three unicast service model in the traditional protocol stack architecture. That is not the way it is used with Fabric Connect. It's used as a control plane only. It moves no user data. It programs the Ethernet forwarding database, the link state database, by the use of the specified type length values for layer two, layer three, multicast services, and even extensions into IPv6. This is the primary architectural difference that you need to understand, is ISIS is not a routing protocol. It is really a control plane in this instance. 
And all of the services are not vertically dependent. In other words, layer three services within Fabric Connect are not dependent on layer two predefined services underneath. Everything is horizontally mutually independent, which lends to an incredible services fabric uptime. Some of our biggest customers are hospitals, state and local governments, military, manufacturing, where service uptime is key. And what they found is because of this protocol architecture that Fabric Connect is based on, they can make whole scale changes to the fabric, both physically or logically through service extensions, modifications, deletions, and the service uptime stays consistent throughout all of it. There is virtually no downtime. So more importantly, our hospital customers and healthcare customers have found that they can shrink down their window change times to be almost negligible, which is a big benefit to healthcare and a big benefit to the patients and a big benefit to the hospitals themselves. The same types of benefits are translated into manufacturing, military, state and local government, where service uptime and continuation of services is very, very key. So this is a major protocol architecture difference, and it's an important thing to understand holistically. And the slide kind of gives you a good conception of what goes on. However, it's not enough to read the link state database. We need more specific information. And we get that by providing a table. And that table will give us the type length values that are defined within ISIS currently within Fabric Connect. You can see that there are three classes. We first of all have our gray class, which is the pre-existing ISIS like type length values that have been around for quite some time. Uh, first of all, we have the ISIS area, as we recall our manual area is 10.01. We have our end system information, which is type length value three. That's the BMAC and the sys name. So basically the BMAC and the system name of the element itself. Type length value 22 gives us the extended reachability or adjacencies. You will recall that switch four was connected to switch one and three. You can see that our protocol, uh, which is SPBM, obviously. And then you can also see that there is a type length value uh, for IP reachability, which is for IP shortcuts in the GRT. And that's type length value 135. We will see that value because as you will recall, we, we activated that at the time of our, uh, our service uh, setup for the node itself in the first video. The green class in the middle basically calls out the type length values that are defined by the IEEE SPV standard, that is 802.1aq. And you can see there are two. One is largely from an instrumental perspective for ISIS, and it's used in ISIS hellos. It moves BDID information, SPBM instance information, and used to basically establish the equal cost tree algorithms. We got some inkling of that when we did the show ISIS SPBM unicast tree in the last video. So we'll get a little bit more insight into that as well as far as how services behave at that level. Type length value 144, a little bit more useful for us administrators, that gives us the SBVM instance, the nickname of the service node, the BBLANs, and the ICIDs. And it's important to get that information and understand because that gives you insight as to how the ICIDs are being treated from an ECT algorithm perspective. Okay. The blue TLVs at the bottom of the screen are IETF extensions that were created over and above the IEEE standard. And you can see that there are three. Uh, and we'll talk about one that's not listed here right at the end. Type length value 184 defines IPVPN, what we call a layer three virtual service network. And that is equivalent to an RFC 4364 MPLS BGP IPVPN service. Okay, so that is a big sentence to say, and it's also a big consolidation of service entries for the equivalent service. And that's a big thing that we'll talk about when we start talking about layer three VSNs. The two type like values at the bottom, 185 and 186, provide information on IP multicast. And you can see that there are two types, obviously, for the two type like values, constrained, uh, which basically indicates that these are service entries that we want to lock down and constrain within a specific VSN, whether it be layer two or layer three. And then type length value 186, which basically is unconstrained, as it were, and provides the ability for IP multicast stream availability on the GRT or VRF0. 
Now, there is another type link value that has been activated within Fabric Connect that provides IP reachability for IPv6 on the GRT, and that is type link value 236. We're not showing it on this table. We're also not going to run it in this lab or in this video series. Uh, we may run it as an ancillary video towards the end uh, after configuration and fault management, uh, depending on people's interest. So with that, we now have uh, background information on what we're going to be looking at within the fabric architecture. Again, uh, we're going to be looking at the network from the perspective of switch four, but I just want to provide a little caution here and avoid confusion because this is where people get confused is when we see the table listed, when we actually start to look at the link state database, you're going to see that the first switch we're going to look at is going to be switch one. And we're going to look at the entries in the link state database for switch one. So while we're sitting at switch four, we're looking at the entries of the database from the perspective of switch one. And that's an important thing to realize. And if you don't remember it, you'll get confused. So let's just, uh, I just wanna, wanted to revisit that ahead of time. So here we are, we're interfaced to switch number four. You can see we're command enabled, uh, we're at the prompt. We're gonna run the show ISIS LSDB command, which gives us the basic flow of the actual link state database environment. You remember last time we had all of these entries in the environment and each actual switch had multiple BMAC entries with these curious numbers in the back. We're gonna kind of go into a little detail of that right now and explain what that means. These are basic what we call LSP ID entries. And ISIS is a very unique protocol and it's very efficient in the fact that it works on atomic triggered updates. And it does so based on these type link values. And they're kind of grouped in categories that are kind of corresponding in a lot of ways to the screen I just showed. So you have multiple LSPDs and you'll notice that switch number four has only three, whereas all the other switches have four. So that tells us immediately that, well, there's something different here. We have something different. That's true. Uh, switch number four really has nothing but IP shortcuts configured. There is really no other service entries. We don't have L2 VSNs. We don't have L3 VSNs. So you can guess that this fourth one kind of moves information specific to VSNs, right? It makes sense. So now we're seeing this a little bit more detail, but we don't know really how this is represented yet but it allows for very small atomic triggered updates that are basically sent out to each node uh, at the time a service entry is created or deleted or modified, whatever the case may be. So here's the actual view of the link state database, but if we wanna show the detail and we wanna see how these LSP IDs relate, let's do the show ISIS LSDB detail. And that's nothing more than the LSDB command with a detail extension. And you can see that the depth of knowledge we start getting off of the network becomes quite a bit different. And the first thing we see is the entry for switch number one. Again, I want to call the fact that now we're looking at this database and even though we're logged into switch number four, we're looking at entries reported into the database from the perspective of switch number one. So here we have our switch, our host name itself. We have obviously our LSP ID, and you can see that this provides us our lower level prefix, which gives us all of our lower level information, all of the lower level TLVs, the area address, our adjacencies. And you can see that we're attached to switch two and switch four, and that is correct. Switch one is attached to switch two and switch four. If we move further, we see our protocol entry, TLV129. We see our host name, TLV137. We also see that we have type link value 144. And this gives us our information on our backbone VLAN IDs, first of all, gives us some insight into the ECT algorithm, but it also gives us our nickname, as you can see, and note how we show two zeros here, uh, but we only had to enter one in the script. So just a little bit of semantic difference there. Now, if we move further on down the table listing, we see that we're coming to a different LSP ID. And that gives us a secondary aspect. 
further information as we move on down the line. Type length value 144. And you can see now that we're looking at different ICID information. So we see that we have TLV 144, uh, but we have sub TLV 3. This gives us information on the ICIDs that we have provisioned. If you recall in the first video, no, the second video, I apologize, we had two ICIDs in the network, uh, 1000 to 2000. We can tease a bit of information about the ECT algorithm by this entry here. We can look and see that we have 1000 and 2000, but on 4051, they're shown as, trans, or as receive only. This is a key critical information. This is indicating that 1000 and 2000 is not using the primary BVID. And we know that to be the fact as well. If we go further on down the line, we see that we also have information showing that we have type length value uh, 144 sub TLV3 on BVID 4052. And here we're showing that 1000 and 2000 are showing both transmit and receive. Now, a little bit of technical detail of why this happens. First of all, the entry of both transmit and receive shows that, yes, this is the primary BVID uh, for these ICIDs. Even ICIDs, again, always go on the secondary BVID. We know that our secondary BVID is 4052, so this all syncs up. Now, if we, we can see that we're looking at type length value 135. We can also see that we have our ISIS source address for the node itself. And we also have the management IP network that we set up as well. So that's important information. Going further on down the line, we can also see that we have IPVPNs. We can also see that the ICIDs are ICID 5000 and 6000. Now, from a practice perspective, I usually put loopback addresses on the VRFs. The reason why is they'll show up in the link state database whether I have an active subnet or not. So I can see that ICID 6000 is up and running, and I have an active loopback address within that VPN. However, I have no user networks that are up and active. Here, I can see ICID 5000 does have a user network that's up and active. And I can also see that I have my loopback there as well. So again, knowing how to read the database gives me the ability to look and say, oh, look, I've got 10.50.10.0. That's up, it's active, it's resident in switch one, and its residence is in the VRF that belongs to ICID 5000. That is quite a bit of information, folk. So you can see the value that these LSP IDs have as they move information down the line. And this is more or less rep replicated. And I just want to do one further look here to type length value 185, which, as we will recall, is the IPVPN uh, or constrained uh, value of multicast. And you can see that we have two entries. We have a uh, 1577, we have 1578, all 16 million. And the Multicast address is, is basically U, UPPN, uh, so that, that's a, a universal plug and play, uh, and these cameras are just running that as an environment. I don't really have any active uh, multicast services running, but you can see even UPPN uh, shows up, uh, and it gives us our source IP addresses, it gives us the multicast group address, and it gives us the relevant ICID that we have within the environment. Going further on down the line, uh, we can see that we have entries with switch two, switch three, switch four, all the way down the line uh, until we come back to ours at the bottom, which will be ourselves in the perspective of the network from ourselves. We're not gonna go into any further detail on that. Uh, what I do wanna show you is the ability to tease information out of the database. As you can see this is quite a bit of information and uh, it's, it's quite a long table. If you get into a very, very big network, this can be quite a large table if you're gonna show the whole fabric. So it's important to be able to tease certain pieces of information that you may want out of the environment. And this gives us the ability to do that by calling out the specifics of certain type length values. So the first thing we're going to do is do a show ISIS uh, LSDB on type length value uh, 135, which is, we will recall, is IP shortcuts. And we're going to use the detail extension after that. 
So now you can see that we get a table condensation of just type length value 135. And it gives us all our IP reachability within the network, our source IPs for the ISIS protocol, the management network that we can see is resident. And then finally, we have our 10.10 uh, uh, network, which I talked about in the previous video, which is my administrative subnet. And we can see that it's validated again as being resident in switch three. So this is all good information for us. I can also do a show. Let's just uh, hit the up arrow and uh, we'll just kind of back up and do a show 144 detail. This is going to give us information on the L2 VSNs. So here we show that we have our layer two VSNs listed out, giving us all the residences of 1000 and 2000. And you may have taken note of this high order ICID, which is the highest available ICID in the range. That's used for the triggered updates. And you'll notice that has residence on both BBID 4051 and 4052. And that's basically how these LSP IDs provide updates to every other switch so that the uh, database is always coordinated. So this gives us the detail on uh, the layer two VSN environment. If I did the same command with a 184. Now I'm saying show me the IPVPN environment. I want to understand what the IPVPN environment looks like. And again, you can see it's quite a bit more condensed. We have uh, switch one, uh, ISID 5000 and 6000. We have an active customer subnet of uh, 10.50.10.0. And down below, we see that uh, in switch number three, uh, we have uh, those same ISITs terminated, uh, 5,000 and 6,000, and we have an active user subnet of 10, 50, 30. Now, in the middle, we see switch number two. It also has those VRF terminations, but there are no active customer subnets. So we can see that ISIT 5,000 is the only one with active customer subnets. And that is switch three, which is 10.50.30.0, and switch one, which is 10.50.10.0. So a lot of good, good information that we can pull out of the environment by using these link state database extensions, okay? Uh, so you can troubleshoot and look at quite a bit of detail uh, on the link state database itself. And I encourage you to do that sometime. Take the time, build out a fabric, go through the fabric, use the different commands uh, to, to kind of tease out the different type length values. Uh, go in, provision an L3 VSN, and then go in and run the type length value for 184 detail and see the results, see the impact. Uh, another thing you might want to do is play with multicast. Light multicast up, run TLV 185 or 186, see the results. And once you start doing that, you're going to get used to reading the database environment and exactly what it's telling you as a network administrator. So that's pretty much it. Uh, well, this is a long video, 24 minutes, but uh, I think you can see that it was kind of required. Now that we have this foundation of knowledge, we're going to take time and start to provision network services. Okay. We understand the environment. We've set up the node. We have some show commands under our belt. We We've done the link state database detail, and now it's ready to move forward and actually start to actively provision and work with services. Thanks.